Romans. Are you in Ephesians? Chapter 6. And um, last week I preached a message on standing, and I just feel there's some more stuff in there for us um, to be blessed with. I'm going to read, uh, I read the whole chapter last week. I did give you some homework. I'm sure you've all done it. Go on home, read the whole book. Um, so I'm just going to read from verse 10 um, this morning to verse 20. It says, finally, you remember Paul, um, you know, he's been in and out of prison. Um, they, they thought they killed him a few times by now, but uh, by miracle power, he walked away from it. Um, he says uh, in the course of his letters that he'd been uh, starving, that he'd been shipwrecked, um, that he'd been turned upon by his own people, that he had no clothes, he'd been naked, um, and all of these different types of things had happened to him. Um, and so keep it in mind as you read um, this letter. It's not written by some princess, uh, you know, who's in a palace somewhere. Um, this guy has risked his life uh, for years and years and years for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. And this word standing um, keeps reappearing during the course of this chapter. Um, Paul is speaking to Christians, come on, stand. Don't be pushed off course. Don't be shoved around. We're the people of God, amen? And we have an armor that's been given to us. We have a Lord that goes before us. We have promises that can't be broken. Um, and so we shouldn't be so easily moved. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Paul is saying, you know what? There are things out there in the heavenly realms. They are against you. They do want to harm you, but you can stand because we have authority. Is that all right? You okay, guys? You feeling fresh this morning? You're looking good. I'm enjoying looking at you all. We can stand. That, I don't want to know what that was. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, it doesn't say a lot just in case you get, uh, you know, taken randomly out of a sample group of Christians. Uh, everybody needs to be aware and prepared for the fact that there is a day of evil and it will come. It doesn't say if it comes or whatever. It says when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Say amen. amen. It doesn't say uh, you might be able. It says you will be able. I, I am wanting, you know, after preaching a series and other people are going to help on standing, that everybody in the room and those who can't be here today who have been receiving God's word unto themselves will say, you know what, no matter what happens when the day of evil, the day of failure, the day of disappointment, the day of depression, the day of discouragement, the day of brokenness, whatever happens, when it comes, I will stand. Amen? I will not be moved off my purposes. I won't be moved out of my church. I won't be cut off from the ministry. I won't be disjointed from God's promises. I will stand. Because my God says I will stand. Amen? Come on. This is God's word spoken by someone. If anyone would have folded up and given up, it would be Paul. Because when you read about what he went through, you think, how could this, how could one human being endure all of that stuff? Um, but he did. He said, when it comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers, and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, Paul says, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Isn't that good? 
What a hero. Amen? I cannot wait to meet that guy. Um, it's going to be um, a great time to be able to see all the saints who have stood their ground before us. We're only here because people stood their ground. I'm sure when this church started with Jeff and Linda and uh, seven others, I think might have been nine, did you say, Jeff? And um, T as well, nine people that the devil was thinking, I don't want any uh, care and blessing. I, I want to discourage the people in this area. I want to deceive them. Uh, you know, I want to control them. And when they started, I'm sure the devil tried to push them off course. And I remember Jeff telling me a story one day that there was a meeting a long time ago discussing about whether to continue the church or not and all the rest of it. Well, here we are. Because they took their stand. Amen? Amen? Why don't you give Jeff and Linda and Tini and Sue and the others who took their stand? And we are here. Last week I, I read the, the whole chapter and I just want to recap if you weren't here or if you are here, it's good just to hear again. Um, I spoke about this, who's moving you? Who's moving you? God wants to move every believing person into his purposes, into his promises, into some ministry that is satisfying, that you'll see good days and enjoy yourself, amen? And so often we find ourselves on the outer, we find ourselves discouraged, uh, we find ourselves... Um, you know, distant and isolated and all of those things. Who's moving you? The Bible says it's we will rise up on eagles' wings and it's the Spirit of God that comes and moves us. And if it's not God, don't move. Amen? Don't be discouraged. Um, don't give up and don't quit. I also spoke this, uh, don't put your future in the hands of people. God will open the doors. We don't need to be seeking people, platforms, privilege, and all of those things. We don't need that. I said last week, I, I really felt strongly that God was going to help me and, and bring me to a place where I could preach to people, which he's doing, and, and that's happening. But at the time that the promise came, 18 years ago, um, I couldn't get uh, a place to preach anywhere, I thought. Um, and... And I was just really confused about the calling. It would have been so easy to give up. But God showed me um, a door into the children's ministry where I could preach for two minutes every Sunday to five-year-olds. Amen? What a precious privilege that was. And he said, see, there is a door open for you. And so I didn't need to pursue people and try and get opportunities for myself. I just need to look at who I've got in front of me. And, um, and God will make a way. Don't put your hands, uh, your future, sorry, in the hands of other people. It said Jesus would not entrust himself to man because he knew what was in man. And he thought, I'm not going to let these guys lead me. So you don't let your family lead you. Fair enough? Ooh, all the kids are like, well, I, I remember one thing from church this morning. <laughs> You're not the boss. Um, we, we've been put in families to get instruction and to be loved and, and to be able to grow and flourish. But the point is this, God will lead you. And even parents, you've got to accept and admit the fact that God has a plan for your children you don't even know about. It says, raise up your child in the way that he or she should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. So God has the plan. And the last thing I said, very eloquently put, was watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. James, the brother of Jesus, says, Your tongue can set it, the words you speak can set a course for your life. You could end up anywhere. It can start a fire that you can't put out, and it can cause a lot of havoc in your world. And we've got to watch. I know you think some stuff. I spoke about hitting your thumb with a hammer, which I've done probably 150 times growing up, and I can feel words brewing in my mind that want to come out, and you think, Oh, well, they're in there. My boss used to say to me, you know the words are in there, you might as well have them out. And I used to think, no, they're not coming out because they could set a direction for my life and I'm not going to let them out. Amen? And so I just talked about a no-fly zone in your head with words that shouldn't be there. And so we spoke about it. This week I'd like to concentrate on just the last half of only uh, one verse and um, stir us up a little bit. And it's this verse. It says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I wanted to speak to you about God's Word this morning. 
Um, it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, it's something that has um, done my life so much good, blessed my life in ways that I would love to tell you and, and all the rest of it. But this morning, I just want to stir you up. God has given us His Word. Someone say Amen. amen. God has given us, a, a, we call it a Bible, um, and uh, it is a revelation. It unpacks for us, it unfolds for us, it describes for us, it connects us with who God is, and it is good. It's all good from the very first verse. It says, in the beginning. Amen? And in the beginning, you see that God is all about doing good. It's all about bringing forth His goodness. And all the way through Scripture, it talks about God doing good. When we fouled up, messed up, and, and disjointed ourselves from God, He had a plan. Genesis 3.15 talks about that plan. It says that He has put an enmity, a seed, um, of his own against the seed of our enemy. And that's the very beginning, the first little bit of preaching about Jesus coming to earth. And then the whole rest of the Bible is talking about God's preservation of his promises, God's blessing on his people, and that the coming of his seed, what it will be like, who, who it will be, and, and what good it will do. And so all of this stuff for them, uh, you know, reading it, for us looking back at it, for them going through it, and then we get the Gospels. And we finally see God in the flesh. Man, what a shake-up that was, to see God in the flesh. I don't know about you, but I grew up with a thousand pictures in my head about what God would be like. True? I thought God was like a gunslinger, uh, with all types of tools of torture in his belt. Canes, whips, guns, tasers, anything else. And when I stepped out of line, he was going to give it to me, both barrels. And enjoy it, too. Um, and so that's what I thought. When I saw Jesus, God in the flesh, I was like, man, this guy's super cool. He loves people. People like me. Broken brats like me. He loves people who are lost. He loves people who are hurt. He loves people who are offended. He loves people who are broken. He loves people who are isolated. And I'm just like, man, when is this real, you know, when's the real character going to come out? When's the gunslinger going to appear? Well, Put to the test over a thousand days. Nothing shows up. Not a bunch. On the cross, being murdered by his own creation, being tortured. Nothing comes out. You reckon you're going to squeeze someone there and something bad will come out, wouldn't you? You'd be like, right, that's it. Even Jesus said, uh, if I wanted to, I could call a legion of angels to deal with you. And uh, I'm like, do it, do it. You know you want to do it. <laughs> Uh, but his love and commitment to people just blows my mind. It blows my mind. Just to read, a lot of people sort of don't spend a lot of time. I'm talking about the Word of God, reading really just that little, uh, the last four days of Jesus' life. It blows my mind every time I read it. Um, and if you're not reading it, it's, it's not going to be penetrating your heart. It's not going to be shaping your thoughts. It's not going to be opening your eyes. Um, and when it opens your eyes, you realise what type of man you could be, what type of, of woman you could be, what type of parent you could be, what type of child, what type of sibling. It actually it, it, it shines a lamp on what you'll become by following someone. Amen? So exciting. Um, to read that and, and read uh, all of the stuff in the New Testament. So I just want to um, help us all get a little bit more excited than we are about the Bible. The first thing I'd say about the Bible is this, is there is a lot of um, discouragement out there about reading it and knowing it. Everybody tells you it's so big. The Bible, who would ever know the contents of the Bible? Well, you will if you want to. Because God is a God who does things perfectly well. There is not one page too less or one page too more in the Bible. Because God is a perfect God. He didn't write a great big book and said, oh, that'll stuff him. Well, you think it, don't you? People get their Bible out and they go, oh, stuff. The size of that. You read, you read a few verses, you get to a word you don't understand, you know uh, that's it. To us. Well, you know what God didn't do anything to you? There's, a, there's just a lie out there in the atmosphere that this is going to trick you up. It is perfect for your days. If you live to be 20 years old, it's perfect for your days. 
If you live to be 120 years old, it's perfect for your days. And uh, a lot of them say, like, I've read the Bible. You ever heard that? I have read it. I have worked out. Part of the Red Sea, there I got drowned, read that bit. You heard that? People say that? Yeah, and, um, yeah, David killed Goliath, read that bit. And, um, Jesus rose again, read that bit. And, uh, and all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, I, I can say candidly to you that I have read the New Testament over a hundred times. And every time I read it, um, I am just, I'm like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> What is this strange new thing? And I think, how can, I've even read my notes that I've written about something. I have written everything about this, this little part, except not about that verse. I think, how did I not see that verse? Where has that verse been hiding? And all of a sudden, God's saying, you weren't ready for that verse. Um, you weren't able to see that verse. It wasn't my plan yet to unfold that verse. And it just goes on and on and on. And, um, and so there's 1189 chapters in the Bible because I know you're all curious. 1189. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that your brain, even if you only went to grade six at school, is a machine. Your brain is a machine. If you're a young person here today, if you get, no one has iPods anymore or whatever, if you get your thing, um, out there, you'll probably say, I've oh, got 2,500 songs. Not 1,189, 2,500. I spoke to someone the other day, I said, how many songs do you think? Oh, I have look, oh, 4,000. I said, do you know all the songs? Yeah. Of course I do. What do you think I am? Well, I have on my device and I didn't know them. So you know 4,000 songs? Yeah. You know who sings it? Yeah. You know when they release it? Yeah. I know what album they're on. I know Henry Wigstein. All the rest, I don't have a bridge, I don't have a chorus, I don't have a verses, all the rest. Every song, yeah. Isn't your brain amazing? The stuff that you know. Uh, and there's 1,189 chapters in the Bible, and they are just perfect for you. And you can know every single one of them. You can. Amen? You can know that, you know, the flood came in Genesis chapter 6, and you'll... Because it's a story, you'll think through all the details. Think, I don't know about that stuff. But God visited Noah and gave him a plan. First plans on the earth, building and all the rest of it. And um, he had sons and a wife. And they got to building stuff and they used gopher wood. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> and he put pitch on it, you know, and painted it. And he'd be thinking about all that stuff. And then, of course, in you know, the next chapter, the, the, the ground broke and the rain, first rain fell. And you think, oh, I do know one chapter in the Bible, if you read it. And you go on and, you know, whatever chapter you pick, Exodus 20, you know, you know it's where Moses went up and he was face to face with God for 40 days, didn't eat and drink while God wrote on a tablet for people with care and love. And whatever chapter of the Bible that people say to you, you know, whatever you think, I know that one. Ooh, it's exciting, I know that one. Um, and, and whatever, um, you know, and you just learn. In Mark chapter 5 is that demoniac, that, that demon possessed man with a legion of demons, and you think, oh, I know that story. Cast, Jesus cast the demons into the swine, and they all drowned, and all the rest of it. And, you know, if it's John chapter 15, Jesus talked about being connected to him, the vine, the branches, and every chapter in the Bible has a um, context and there's something um, to it and it's amazing and I just think um, God has done it perfectly well. So can I move on? Is that right? Oh, please do. <laughs> Don't be deceived into thinking that that is too much. Um, if you've got Netflix at home, you have definitely got a brain that can contain all the scriptures. No worries at all. Um, because we fill our brain up with so much stuff and it doesn't take as long as you think. If you're a good reader, it only takes about 10 hours to read the New Testament. So if you wanted to, if you're a good, strong reader, you could just wake up Saturday morning, have breakfast, and just read the New Testament. Still have time to do dishes, walk the cat, put the dog out, all the stuff that you need to do at home, put the washing on the line, easy peasy. Um, if you're not a great reader, it probably take you a bit longer, but the point is you get through it easily. Um, the New Testament, you've got 27 chapters, uh, sorry, books in there, and if you wanted to, I'm just saying if you wanted to, 
um, you could just read one every day for the next 27 days and you're like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> it's amazing. And when you get the book of Jude, you're like, two minutes, <laughs> cheering. Fill them on, two minutes, cheering. Um, so it's there for you. Come on, church. It's there for you. Um, God has given us this amazing thing, his word, that we would know, that would put courage inside us, give us revelation, set us free, um, all these wonderful things I'm going to speak about. Um, I've got to say that because people say, oh, it's just, it's just too big. It's not, it takes about 33 hours to read the Old Testament. If you wanted to, you know, like, if you're a good reader and didn't stop, I'm not saying that you would not be able to stop for 33 hours, I'm just saying, I know how long it takes. Um, get it on CD or your phones these days will talk to you. Did you know that? Siri will read it to you. Google Assist. I don't even know what that is. It's my only friend. Um, and so you can press play and read it to you at a nice leisurely pace and you can read along with it. I find that good. Who gets distracted when they're reading the Bible? Well, if you put the audio on, it's really good because it forces you to follow. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the law. And you can get the Irish girl. Children, obey your parents in the law. See, but this is right. This is right. This is right. You can get the James Earl Jones, you know, Mufasa. You know, that smooth tones of Mufasa. Um, to send it to you. There's more than one voice. Come on. Ask Aaron, he knows all about it. The point is, it can be um, fun. It can be life changing. It's accessible. It's, so it's never been easier to read the Bible. You can read along while someone else speaks in your ear and you can follow it. Um, you can just log yourself in, your phone will tell you, oh, you, you know, it's time to read this, it's time to read that. So, um, and I'm not saying reading it, you know, is the be all and end all, it's allowing the Bible to speak into your heart, is what it's all about. Um, I've met a lot of people, oh, I've read the Bible and all the rest of it, and they play out through it and got the, you know, I tick the box or whatever. It's not about that. It's about allowing His Word to break through issues in your life, His Word to speak truth and minister to you, His Word to remind you how loved you are, for His Word to remind you how fearfully and wonderfully made you are. Who knows where that verse appears? Psalmist David spoke about being fearfully and wonderfully made and it just can keep reminding you uh, all the things that the world is not reminding you of. The world says you're a commodity, you're dispensable, you're usable, even sometimes you're trash, uh, you could be discarded and all of those things. It tells you you're out of date, out of fashion, um, left behind, not cutting edge, in the outer group, um, tells you haven't got enough and all the rest of it and it just creates a whole heap of stress in your world. I, I get really stressed out um, from the messages in the world, but when I get into his word, I get really built up. I'm like, ah, that's right, this is in my home world. <laughs> you know, the world's got its hooks in and said, hold on as tight as you can because I'm getting taken out of here soon. This isn't even my real home. My real home. There's no sickness, no shame, no tears, no crime. My real home, there's no brokenness. You don't own me, world. God owns my soul, my spirit. He paid for it through the blood of his son and he does not lie and he's taking me there. So whatever you've got, it's not going to matter in the end anyway, world. So go away and leave me alone. I better have a look at my notes. I've got three verses I want to share with you this morning and just uh, I'll very quickly flesh out uh, three bits of encouragement for you. Hebrews 4.12 uh, whoever wrote Hebrews, there's no name on it. Some people say Paul could have been uh, uh, one of the ladies. Um, could have been someone else besides Paul, we don't know. But it says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. We love to read that. Just want a context for you. A double-edged sword, by the way, is a weapon that was being used in the time this book was really a bad one, a sharp one. And if someone swung on at you and touched you, you'd look down and think, am I going to die or not? By the amount of blood that was spilling out. Sometimes you look and think, that, that might come good with 30 stitches or so. Other times you see the blood flow and think, I'm done. I'm done. 
Um, and so when you say it's more damaging or sharper than double-edged sword, that puts it in context, amen? It can bring down and kill strongholds in your life like that. I have sometimes had the Word of God working on behalf of my life and through my life, and it, I just felt it slash something. I've looked up I thought, that thing's good. That will never, ever torment me again for the rest of my life. It says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Whoa. God's Word reveals somehow there is actually a divide between the soul and the spirit that the Word of God can penetrate. Is anyone find that interesting? I just think I'm walking along kicking cans all you know, my whole life or whatever. And then all of a sudden the Word of God says, no, there is a, there's a little place between your soul and your spirit that the Word of God, like a scuffle, will come. And I think, what for? What is going on there? You could read that verse and just gloss over it, but I, I'm inclined to think, hang on a minute, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. I'll tell you now, um, you know, being a Christian for a little while, I thank God that the Word of God divides soul and spirit. Because your soul is not a great master for your life. My soul gets depressed, anyone? Not me friends. My soul gets afraid. My soul gets upset. My soul gets defeated. My soul gets angry. And all of those things. If my soul led my life, I would be a mess. I would be a train wreck of a man. Because my soul, my emotions can take me anywhere. But Scripture says that His Word divides between those things. Soul and spirit. And that God can put truth in my spirit, which can lead me, rather than my soul leading me. It's alright to have a soul. I don't want to rip on soulless Christians. Um, but it's not good when your soul leads your life. It can be an incredibly brilliant ally. When I get full of joy, I think that is going to marry up with where my spirit is taking me. Praise God. Let's keep the train hooked up together and keep going. But there are times where my soul gets downcast. David said, come on soul, why are you so downcast? And he began to stir himself up. And I've got to say to some of you guys who just struggle with emotions, the Word of God is the answer. It says it will divide soul and spirit like the sharpest sword you've ever seen. Come on, that's exciting news. If you're struggling in your marriage or something, there is words in God's Bible that will cut through all that soul stuff. Oh, she hurt me. Oh, he hurt me more. Everybody hurts everybody. Hello? Everybody hurts everybody. But the Word of God says to your spirit, I'm leading you from victory to victory. I'm taking you from stronghold to strong place. Amen? And, and our soul can be very, very dangerous when we allow it to lead us. But Scripture says, no, I can divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. He judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Wow. Attitudes. Hmm. Let's talk about your stinking attitudes for a while. Shall we? Nervous laughter. <laughs> um, attitudes can take you to a bad place. I've had some terrible attitudes in my life. I'm still dealing with some today, like you are too, don't lie. And, um, and your attitudes, if you've got an attitude, you know, if, if you've got an attitude of judgment, that is going to take you to a dark place. And you'll probably drag everybody in your net with you. Your attitude, uh, just like your soul, can either serve you well. Scripture says, let your attitude be the same as Christ Jesus. Jesus spoke about him this morning, giving thanks in dark times. My attitude is like, oh, everything sucks, everyone's against me. Imagine Jesus on the cross, everything sucks, everyone's against me. Nobody understands, nobody appreciates everything that I've done, blah, 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 all the rest of it. Um, come on. <laughs> I know I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but I'm just saying we get ourselves into situations nowhere near like being crucified, like the Son of Man was. 
but our attitude can go through the toilet and beyond. Places I don't want to describe, Lockie. Down the s -bend. In through the pipes, and then into a place where all those wonderful attitudes flourish. It's, it's a good point. I oh, know it is, the Bible's making it. Stinginess. There's an attitude that will take the whole city down. Um, if, if we could teach, if we could teach every parent in Logan City how to be generous, the whole planet would change. But there's this stingy attitude um, that locks on to people and, you know, there could be reasons why it gets there or whatever, but I just want you guys to know that the Word of God, His Word, right, the revelation of Him and, and who we are in Him will bring truth and revelation into your spirit that will change your attitude forever. Yeah. If you can change your attitude, you'll end up in a whole different place. Yeah. If you can get mastery over soul, you'll end up in a whole different place. But it says, there's no other advice given, it just says that the Word of God does it. That's amazing, isn't it? It doesn't give any other advice. A lot of people trying to change their attitude. Who had your parents say, change your attitude? How does that make your attitude go sour? Your parents, change your attitude. Okay then. <laughs> so change your attitude. You like to change your face. You like to change the locks on this house. Change your attitude. Parents argue. Well, there's no other way to change your attitude. Your parents should shut the Bible on your door. Read it. It's the only thing. It's the only word. Is that right? The Word of God, listen, I, I know we're having a bit of fun and I want it to be fun. I've heard what preaching on the Word of God get real heavy real fast. Um, but there is, it, it's called the sword of the Spirit that can precisely move between soul and spirit. That's an exciting thing for me. I think, uh, you know, I love people who do counselling and are gifted, but I think it'd be almost out of work if... Um, people would look at that verse and think God can speak things in between this little tiny gap and just separate that and make me healthy again. Because at the moment my soul and my spirit are all jumbled up and nothing's going anywhere good. Um, if you can believe it. And it says it judges the thoughts and attitudes. I tell you what, I hate being judged by people I don't cope to it, but I love being judged by his holy word. When the word of God reveals to you that you're a bit racist, you're like, whoa, I did not know that. Some people look at me this. <laughs> Is he racist? I think I was. I think I was when I became a Christian. I didn't know that. I wouldn't describe myself as one. But as I was reading his word one day, some stuff jumped out at me and I thought, oh, I've got a problem. And, um, and once you say, once they've been judged by the word of God, you're like, I can, I can seek the healer. What is going on here? Uh, what is going on here? And uh, all of these things, all of a sudden, and I've been fixed from issues of lust, from issues of racism. For, I've been uh, controlling, what, what do they say, son of a gun, um, all the rest of it. And, and all of a sudden, when I saw Jesus ministering to people, I'm like, I'm like, don't let him off the hook, Jesus. You know? He says the rich young ruler, go and sell everything you have and then come and follow me. And it says he walked away sad. Don't let him walk away. Sort him out. Deal with him. And, and I'm thinking, come on, God. Surely, God. You know? And, and God's like, hey, I don't control you. I was like, oh. Yes, you. I'm... <laughs> oh. Yeah. You don't control. Oh. I think I might be really controlling. Go back in here and all of a sudden, yeah, the word of God is judging my thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's awesome, isn't it? If you want to um, see change in your life, start reading his word. Allow his word to read in what's in your soul and attitudes in your heart. Is that all right? 2 Timothy 3.16, New Living Translation too, darlings. 
all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realise what is wrong in our lives. The Bible will help us realise what's wrong in our lives. Far out. Our destructive lives that are damaging our own self and everybody else. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Um, I love, um, you know, just that the verses there. I have seen a few Christians, by the way, FYI, this is not what the Bible's for, I've seen a few Christians whack each other over the head with that verse. Have you ever seen that? Every day. It's like, uh, oh, um, you know, some verse talks about re- reproof and correction, and they're like, I think you need a little bit of correction, sister. Go your hardest. Sort your life out. I have seen Christians go for each other with this verse. Um, not as bad as the, work, the verses about uh, wives obey your husbands. I've seen plenty of blokes use that one. And then the women read down and think, well, you're meant to honour me. And, um, and you're meant to love me like Christ loves the church. And uh, <laughs> I thought, you're doing it wrong. Um, I have seen Christians use that verse the wrong way. Let me read it to you again. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us. It doesn't say all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach you. Yeah, you, mate. You. You need it. If anyone needs it, Dave needs it. Dave? 316. Get into it, Dave. Uh, It says to teach us to teach us what is true and to make us realise what is wrong with our lives. Isn't that exciting? The Bible is there to help us and teach us and reveal to us what is wrong with Zach's life. Yeah, I can see from this scripture here, Zach's not doing too well. (laughs) Everything else. And when I apply this scripture to Zach's life, mm, 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 not a good result. Um, actually, it says it's here to teach us to realise what's wrong with our own lives. Praise the Lord, you can fix yourself. You can stop fixing husbands, stop fixing your wife, and stop fixing your kids. You can fix yourself. Isn't that good? Amen? The Bible, if you've got things, if you're genuine about it, guys, and you've got things in your life that you don't like, that God's spoken to you about, that you realise don't reflect the goodness and the glory of Jesus, you can fix yourself by reading His Word. It will nourish you, it will expand your mind, it will strengthen you, it will put courage inside of you, it will release you from burdens, it will forgive you, it will set you free, it will put your feet on a rock, it will give you revelation, it will shine a light, it will do all types of things that release you from burdens, amen? You! It will do it for you! And so God didn't write this and think, well, that'll be hard. He said, this will release the people. This will shine a light on the people. This will bless the people. This will set the people free. This will nourish the people. Amen? This will will help them find forgiveness. This will help them find repentance. This will help them find reconciliation. This will help them find blessing. Help them find light. Help them find goodness. This is going to help them find everything. Help them find my son. Amen? I met a guy once. I was asking, how did you get saved? And he said, I bought a muffin. <laughs> True story. True story. And um, he, this will give away who it is. He's from Mauritius. And um, he bought a cake. They call it cake there. He bought a cake from a guy in one of those wooden trolleys, you know, like a cake vendor. Um, and he sat down to eat it under a tree, as you do, when you buy a cake. And it was wrapped in a page of Bible. And he unwrapped it, and he ate the muffin, read the Bible, and gave his heart to the Lord. (laughs) True story. You can ask him yourself. And I just think, um, just these words will lead people to God's Son. Lead them to a place where they think, I'm I'm giving up, I I can't strive anymore, I can't do any better. I need the majesty of God's Son of my life. I need him to come and save and take my life. Uh, I found out I was bound by money. 
I realised there was something wrong with my life. I was bound by money. What a disgusting, deplorable day that was. So I'm really out of that. No, I'm not, no, I'm not. No, I'm not, no, I'm not. Keep reading the Bible. Oh, sometimes. <laughs> but generally not. Read a bit more. Well, it's a battle. <laughs> Everyone's in a fight. Everyone's walking their walk. It's a journey, right? It's a journey. <laughs> Read a bit more. <laughs> I'm in chains. <laughs> I'm in prison. I uh, can see those, you know, those super, you know, the bars come down, the doors close, the infrared lasers go across, and all the rest of it, that was me. Um, but you know what? God's Word helped me fix my life. Yeah, the truth, the revelation came in somewhere and said, Jesus spoke, led to me one day, don't worry about what you're wearing. I'm thinking, oh, I'm worried about how many properties I'm going to own by the time I'm whatever. And Jesus saying, don't worry about what you're wearing. God will take care of these things. God has a plan for these things. He's going to bless your life. I found out I was bound by the law. Um, I got pulled over last night. Breathalyzed. And a few other things I would like to say. I've got a clean bill of health. Um, I was very concerned because I was speeding. Um, and I remember thinking, see that car's close behind me. Whatever. And um, Paul was constantly saying, you're speeding, you're speeding, you're speeding. It's worse than the little thing on the speed over speed, over speed. Um, but I thought, oh no, um, I'm in trouble. And I thought, no, it's going to be okay. Um, I'll either get off or God will supply the funds that I need <laughs> to get me through. I'm way off course now. I found it, I was bound by the law. Um, and then I read this verse in Galatians 5.1. It says, It was for freedom that you were set free. And it talks about again standing firm in your freedom and salvation. And I realised that I was half um, trying to please God and do good and, and all those things, be more righteous than everybody else, and half trying to walk in freedom and walk in grace. And um, God was a bit like, I'd prefer you to be one or the other, uh, but don't try and be both. And I realised that I was putting myself under the law of God until I read Galatians 5.1. The psalmist, my last verse, and I'll finish this point, the psalmist wrote this, Psalm 27 verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Any scaredy cats in the house? Anybody worried about losing a job? Anybody worried about not getting a job? Anybody worried about losing kids? Anybody worried about uh, not getting promoted? It's spiders, it's spiders. I mean, no scripts are going to save you from that, brother. <laughs> we could start a home group for people who are scared of spiders. Stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. If you've got fears about being judged, if you've got fears about um, not finding a partner to do life with, if you've got fears about not making enough money, you've got fears about not being loved, you've got fears about being rejected, you've got fears about uh, being caught out for your past, you've got fears that you won't. Get a job that your kids are going to do this or do that when they grow up. Fears, 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 fears. I can, I can actually sit here until the sun goes down and just keep rattling off all the things that we could possibly be afraid of. Afraid that we're going to die. Afraid that we're going to get sick. I've got my friends in the house. Amen. We're afraid that um, someone's going to laugh at us. Afraid that someone's going to challenge our faith. Afraid that someone's going to assault us, abuse us. Afraid that people are going to take advantage of us. We're afraid that people aren't going to accept us. I could, I could go on and on and on. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? When we gather together, when we 
read His Word. All the information, all the promises, all the revelation, all of that stuff comes to light as we sit and read it, enjoy it, and blessed by it, nourished by it, encouraged by it. It will take away every fear that you've ever had in your life. And if you're honest, we actually are very fearful people. Um, we like to say the right answer. You know, like you pray to someone, oh, no, I've got God on my side. Yeah, well, I'd like to get your thoughts for 20 minutes when you go to sleep at night. That would be an interesting tour. Um, come on. Be true. Be honest. Be real. That's what I love about the Bible. It's so real. It says that these couple were, uh, you know, sitting, having sex, and someone came and speared them through the genitals. So I thought, oh. Uh, it says that Jesus wept. I'm like, oh, oh there's no coming back from that. I was trying to think of something that's so real in the Bible. It says that one guy who was working against God was sitting on his throne and he fell and burst open. He was full of worms. That's real. You read about that. The Bible is so honest. Everybody's sin is recorded. It's true. Everybody's sin is recorded. Yet, there's something in the atmosphere around churches where we think it's probably better to hide it. Yet everything's laid bare. David's adultery is laid bare. His murders are laid bare. There were some youths who, who um, mocked a prophet and they got mauled by a bear. I think, please don't put the story about the kids being hit by a bear in the Bible. Yet there it is. It talks about water and blood running out of the side of Jesus. Scientists have since found that there's a sack of clear fluid around your heart to keep it cool because it's the only muscle that just never stops working day and night. It overheats, but it's got its, it's water. Um, and it says they, they ran a spear up in underneath his side and out came this blood and Everything is shown to us. Everything. You don't need to hide your life from God or other people. Amen? If you want to grow, you've got to actually get with some trusted people and let that stuff out. You know, I have got a lot of fears, actually. I call them paranoias. I have anxiety. I'm a depressive type. I'm angry all the time. I'm upset all the time. I feel like people ignore me all the time. I feel left out. I feel like there's walls up and around me. Feel, feel, we feel stuff, don't we? I feel this, I feel that. Well, why don't you get with someone, stand with someone, and allow the Word of God just to begin to penetrate between soul and spirit. Allow it to judge every thought and attitude, and allow it to heal your life. It says, Whom should I be afraid? 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection from the dead. It says, Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, oh, death is your sting, you got nothing. You can't hold anyone in the grave any, anymore now because one person's let us out, one person's found the way out. So many people I meet are afraid of dying, yet the Word of God says, where is your victory? Jesus stomped you, rocked you, walked all over you, and he stood up right and he's leading the church today and leading his people into victory. You do not have hold of my life. There is someone greater than you. Get out of my world. Amen? For all those who are afraid of dying. For those who are feeling like everything is going to be torn and taken from you, uh, go and read Exodus. Chapter 14, chapter 15, about God taking the people through the sea, through the ocean, drowning the enemy, taking the people on the dry land, and taking them in underneath his wings, amen? That is a scripture for you. God is going to bless your life, bless your world, set you up for victory. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And if you know who he is, if you bother to listen, read, talk, or discuss anything about who he is, 
you'll know that he is for you, that he is faithful, that he is true, and that he is able. Amen? And he can be the one that can lead your life in an incredible victory, even through seasons of brokenness. Amen?